In this video, we're going to be getting an update on a revolutionary cryptocurrency, one that's going to completely transform payment systems. Using Wi-Fi without NordVPN could mean sharing your private stuff with more people than you think. NordVPN. Online security starts with a click. Token Metrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Hey, Eric, thank you so much for making yourself available. You are one of the team or you're connected to ValCurrency.com. You and I have spoken before. I've done a couple of videos on Val and hope to carry on doing them. And it is rather innovative and revolutionary. Do you want to say a little bit about what Val does? And I have got a full, actually, before you do that, before I introduce you, I have got a full interview with you where we go into it in detail about Val Currency, how it works, but we'll get a short overview of it now. And you can go and watch that video to get more in-depth analysis. But before I continue, please subscribe, follow me on Twitter, CryptoRichYT, join my official Telegram announcements channel, and you can find me on Odyssey, bit.ly slash CryptoRichOdyssey, where I post more videos than I do on YouTube, because YouTube shadow bans and censors. I'm also on bit.ly slash CryptoRich3Speak, which is a, another censorship-resistant platform. Okay. Hey, Eric. Good to be here. Yes, yes. It's been a while. Thank you so much for making yourself available. You are in Europe currently. You've been at a VAL conference. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about what's coming up with VAL. Do you want to start by saying a little bit about what VAL is and what makes it so distinctive? Um, yeah, absolutely. VAL is uh, first and foremost a discount token. Um, what it does is it allows merchants to reduce their price without uh, incurring a loss of profit which is which is kind of an interesting concept uh, in a way something that's never been done before right uh, it's um it's one of those things where two plus two equals two uh, equals four the whole the whole you know of our history that's how it works and then all of a sudden two plus two equals i don't know six or something else right and you go huh how does that work um but uh, that's that's what it is Right. And, and in a nutshell, how it works, I go to a shop, I purchase goods, the shop which is part has bought into the Val uh, as a partner or using Val, then gives me tokens, which I can then use elsewhere. Um, exactly. Um, pretty much anywhere. And, and those tokens act as a discount against the price of whatever, against the price of the goods that I purchased. Yeah, I mean, um... From a legal perspective, the tokens are an entitlement to a price reduction. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually make a payment in those tokens. You present them, and the merchant is obliged to reduce his price by the amount that you present. Right. And who set this up is a guy called Bish, who's got a long, long history in a supermarket and retail discount schemes. Yeah. Lo lo loyalty programs has oh, been. That's it his thing forever and so he understands that market super well yeah and uh, ico back in uh, late 2021 small ico and it's been building and building and building and growing ever since yes it used to be called uh, the cashback app it had an uh, an app and um the whole system was called cashback in fact i think the the non-production version of the app is still called cashback uh although they've they've really moved away from their model because their model was primarily um they they managed loyalty rewards programs on behalf of of other companies because it's a very you know complicated thing uh but that was still under the old model where in essence the value given to the customer comes from the the, the merchants pockets you know merchants have to surrender some of their profit to their customers as, a, as an incentive to to shop with them and that's the bit that changed you know now it's it doesn't cost the retailer anything to discount the product right right okay very good very good all right and then like i said people can watch my video with you the longer interview to get more into it mm -hmm. okay so you which incidentally uh, a lot of people have watched 
Yes. Um, to my great delight, because that means I, I don't have to explain things over and over again. Yes, 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 yes. And to my delight as well. So if you're watching this, please do share it. Share all my videos, comment, like, spread the word, and don't watch them on YouTube. Come over to Odyssey and watch them there. Yeah, much uh, much better uh, an experience, definitely. Yes. All right. So um, you're at a conference in, um, was it in Frankfurt. 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 Okay. So yeah. what, what was this conference about? Why was it? So uh, that event was the premiere of what we call the Last Network. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of the Last Network is that there's um, there's a whole world of multi-level marketing out there, and uh, I mean you might know this concept from like Tupperware in the fifties, I think, yeah. or sixties. Um, anyway, Herbalife. Yeah, Herbalife has done extremely well with that, and uh, it's a it's a legitimate business structure, um, and it has been primarily used in the world of products, like a lot of home products and things like that, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so the, the basic idea is that you get recruited into one of these networks, and you have your own sort of network of people that you talk to your friends. So you have like house parties, and you bring them over, and you tell them about Tupperware. And so they buy some Tupperware from you. But then you tell them, look, but you could sell it. You could have your own house party. And then and then you form this tree of, of revenue where all the guys that I bring underneath me, you know, uh, I get a little cut of what they make. And then the guy above me makes a cut of me and so on and so forth. And the, the amounts get smaller and smaller as you go up to the top. But also the tree gets deeper and wider. Mm. Um, and so it's a great concept. And in Germany, there is a lot of MLM. Uh, actually, not just in Germany, in Mexico too, um, mm -hmm. and we have we have a nice presence in Mexico um, in 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 this front. And the basic the basic concept is uh, that the single most important thing that the Vow ecosystem needs to to mature to reach maturity is liquidity. So we have created an MLM structure around liquidity provision. You can now host a little party at home and get all of your friends to provide liquidity to the network um, and and then bring other people to ha have their own little parties and bring other people to provide liquidity. And we've had uh, an, an unbelievable level of commitment. Um, uh, there, there was a great deal of excitement at the conference. I mean, it was a, it was a one day thing and I, I was a keynote speaker, so I gave a, a talk and we can, you know, we, we can talk a little bit about what that, you know, what that experience was like. Okay. All right. So, how does the MLM structure work with the liquidity, and, and how does how does somebody provide the liquidity? Uh, right. So, um, liquidity is provided with Vow itself and some other token. Right. So, there's there's a whole bunch of liquidity pools out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Vow to VUSD, for example, or Vow to VGBP, Vow to VEuro. Uh, and then there are some liquidity pools that are set up between the V currencies. So V dollars against V euro, V euro against V pounds, you know, and so on and so forth. And there are some liquidity pools between VAL and Ethereum and VAL and uh, uh, other coins. So right. a liquidity provider has, um, has really a world of choices in terms of where to place his liquidity. And ultimately, what's going to sort of determine where all the liquidity goes is is where the yield is being provided. Uh, my my own perspective is that a VUSD to USDC pool is probably going to attract a lot of attention because that is going to be the primary um, the primary path for retailers to uh, to operate. Right. So at least in the beginning, because what's reasonably going to happen is that a lot of retails that are signed up onto Vow don't don't really understand the value of of what they have, uh, or the system isn't uh, isn't mature enough and sp spread enough that the retailers, in taking V dollars back, um, they they won't have other venues of use for them. Right now, the the cool thing is that. Um, Merchants can actually pay their employees in V dollars, let's mm -hmm. say, right? So they, they issue the V dollars, they're out there with the customers, 
the V dollars come back from the customers to the merchant. And the question is, what does the merchant do with them, with the V dollars? And if the merchant can pay, let's say, a vendor with them, great, then they just pay the vendor. Um, if they can pay their employees, okay, wonderful too. If they can use it for marketing campaigns or things like that, okay, they'll, they'll do that. But um, they may want to convert them to hard dollars, to real dollars. Mm -hmm. And so we have a secondary market, which is basically a liquidity pool that has V dollars versus USDC. And that means that they can dump their V dollars into that and then get USDC out, which is imminently bankable, right? Yeah. You can then go burn those tokens for bank dollars and do whatever it is that you want to do. And I think at least in the beginning, that is likely to be um, a pathway for a lot of merchants. And so we need to provide liquidity in that, in that area, right? That means that if that's the liquidity pool that gets the most use, where the most transactions happen, that's also the liquidity pool that generates the most yield and the one that's likely to attract a lot of the attention from the last network. Um, later on, you know, as, um, as the system gets more widespread and uh, especially as there start to be a lot of international uh, fund flow of funds, uh, the V dollar to V euro, for example, or the V euro to V pound liquidity pools may become more interesting because now people merchants are not seeking to dump their v dollars for real dollars they're seeking to convert their v dollars for v euros if they're buying products from france or from germany uh, or maybe to v hong kong dollars if they're buying stuff from hong kong or whatever it is right and so that means that we really su supplant the existing forex markets right Wow. And, and that will produce a whole ton of yield, and then therefore the liquidity will, you know, seek to to go find that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Now let, let me just cover a few things if people aren't familiar. So mm -hmm. liquidity pool essentially is a pot of tokens which are traded off against each other, so that whenever somebody comes along to a decentralized a decentralized exchange, peer to peer exchange, there's already supply there for them to buy and sell into, versus waiting for somebody at the other side to take the other side of the trade. Um, That's correct. And uh, to, to be more precise, a liquidity pool is a portfolio of two assets with, this, with the unique characteristics that the assets are priced in terms of each other by the pool. So the pricing isn't market driven, it's algorithmic. Right. Uh, the, the pool being the counterparty in every trade gets to decide at what price it's willing to uh, let go of whichever asset that it's letting go of. And it does so primarily, uh, at least under the uh, the constant product formula. It does so uh, on an algorithmic, on a sorry, on a, an asymptotic basis. So okay. as as you deplete um, one of the two assets in the pool, as meaning to say, as the reserve of that asset within the pool approaches zero, the price the price approaches infinity, right? And that's a really wonderful dynamic because it encourages in fact it demands uh, arbitrage right so if you have a a price in the market uh, that has a that is different from the price in the liquidity pool then arbitrageurs will seek to you know buy here and sell here right and that happens in both directions so that the liquidity pool then is automatically rebalanced by the market at its own cost and mm -hmm. in turn produces yield for the liquidity providers. Yes. Yes. So then people who deposit their tokens into the smart contract will receive a share of the transaction fees and it will slowly it'll grow over time. And um, you know, it's what I do. I provide liquidity on the Osmosis decks and there's also Uniswap and mm -hmm. Pancake Swap. Uh, and I believe pa Uniswap has the largest liquidity pool for VAO. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, at present, we're um, we're hosted mostly on Uniswap uh, and I think Binance Chain, but we will be um, uh, actually that segues a little bit into Val Taxi because we will be um, teleporting value across blockchains, and so that opens up the door for Osmosis and other mm. and other blockchains, DEXs, and liquidity pools. Okay. All right. And then um, how does the MLM structure work? And then we will talk about Val Taxi. Right. So um, it's a typical, I think, six or seven level uh, tree. And um, one of the cool things about it is that at least in the beginning, I think for the first year, 
if you if you become a member at this point, uh, you will not only get the yield generated by the liquidity pools, uh, which is typically in the order of I think 0.3 percent or something, right? Um, which, if you have a very active pool, it can produce quite a lot of yield. Uh, but in addition to that, we are um, we're subsidizing it with a four percent per month um, uh, payment for the first year. I think if you if you make a, a long enough commitment, um, and so on top of the four, so that's a forty eight percent simple, you know, per, per annum simple uh, re, re yield, right? Um, on top of that, you get an override from the, uh, you know, from your downlines. So mm -hmm. if you can bring in a whole bunch of liquidity yourself, then you get a piece of their their transaction yield. Okay. All, okay. It's all the way down to seven lanes, and and interestingly, the the guys that um, the guys in Germany that have this existing network, they're they're 11 levels deep so and from what i understand the three so we had three thousand guys participate right not not everyone could even like show up physically because the biggest room that we could get was at the was at the hotel in the in the airport mm -hmm. in frankfurt and that only hosted 600 people so wow. that was the maximum that uh, that we could get and everyone showed up it was a full packed house but uh, then what we did was we, we put it all on Zoom and everyone followed on Zoom, right? So we had at least 3,000 guys that we believe are all layer one or maybe layer one and two, right? So, so that could grow quick. That oh, could it could. Really it, quick. Yeah. It can, yeah, it has the potential to become massive. Yeah. And there's no, so I'm, much excitement. I mean, I, Eric, I know that you, you are well schooled in finances and money and how it all works, right? And you've got a business background. I don't have a business background, but I do know this, that multi-level marketing or uh, network marketing, as is also known in the UK, mm -hmm. is can be incredibly, incredibly lucrative, especially for people who come in early. Absolutely. One of the confusions that people have is they confuse multi-level marketing with a, with a Ponzi. Yes, that's – and, and in fact, um, MLM can, can often lead to Ponzi-like schemes. So how come, so what makes this distinct? I mean, I've got an answer, but I've not discussed this with you, but I think it's important to address. So why do you say that this is not a Ponzi? Right. Well, that has two very simple answers. The first is that um, a Ponzi scheme by definition is fraudulent. Um, there, there has to be an element in it of uh, obscurity or some, some non-disclosure of of the work the inner workings because if there were a disclosure no one would join it right. uh, so what happens is a lot of uh, a lot of well all the ponzi schemes are illegitimate in their basic structure the second aspect of um of a ponzi scheme is that it has to have a victim someone actually someone has to actually lose um and then be able to to claim damages and um in both cases, the TLN, or short for the, the last network, is not a Ponzi scheme because it is it, it's completely open in or transparent in the way that it works, so that so that investors or participants can make up their mind properly about whether you know what the risks are and uh, and how to participate. And second of all, because the liquidity is provided into pools, and the uh, essentially the the private keys the the tokens are always under the control of the private key of the of the user, mm -hmm. and they never can lose their investment, right? Yep. And, and so there can be no victim in this in this particular case. Yeah, and I'd like to add a third, and you and feel free to use this, uh, which is with a Ponzi scheme, it's only possible for people to make money to profit from bringing in more players into that scheme. That's with that's a, true. Hold on, that, with a that's true of certain Ponzi schemes. Yeah, with a multi-level market, the network marketing, it's possible to make money without bringing people in. So, for example, someone could be a distributor for Herbalife, not have any downline whatsoever, and they're still making good money from because Herbalife's got legitimate products. And similarly, yes, and you Val, are selling the product, so you just become a salesman at that point. Yeah. So with Vow, it's possible for people to add to the liquidity pool without 
being part of the referral system, and they would still earn fees from the liquidity pool. Correct. Yeah. So, so it's 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 kind of like stands on its own. You don't have to. It doesn't rely on new people always coming in, always coming in. Because interestingly, we're not going to talk about this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people who know coiners think that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. When actually, the <laughs> real Ponzi scheme is fractional reserve banking, because that would be <laughs> more debt has got to be created to keep the current debt afloat. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a that's a wonderful point that I I make every time I ch every chance I get. Right. It's yeah. the the fact that. Um, you know, the, I mean, the reality is that, you know, the world is so full of people who only half understand things. Yeah. And so you hear what you hear is a lot of noise. A anyone who calls Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme clearly doesn't understand what a Ponzi scheme is. Yeah, or doesn't, uh, yeah and doesn't know the Ponzi scheme that fractional reserve banking is. And, it, and yeah. while we're on this, a little, another bet noir of mine is, given that you're in France, is uh, people saying that Bitcoin is energy intensive and environmentally damaging. Well, what about fractional reserve banking and all the wars that it engenders? And oh, oh. oh yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> okay, I mean, moving on. Let's go back to that. <laughs> <Slight. laughs> There's a little intermission yeah, that's, there. <laughs> that, that's a rabbit hole right there. We could that's we right. could talk about that for for a bit. <laughs> the rich rent. Um, all right. So, so how? So what is it? Do how do people get links? Because I'm not part of this, and I'm interested. So I would get a link. Sure. Right. And then people would click on the link. Um, they can go to thelastnetwork.com, mm -hmm. and there are videos there that uh, that explain what it is, how it works, all this kind of stuff, and um, and then just go play. And I would like to add one one thought, which is that um, liquidity pools. Well, there there's a concept around liquidity pools called uh, impermanent loss. Yes, which. You know, investors are uh, advised to to seek a definition for. But uh, I'll I'll describe it very quickly. If I were to buy a pool of Vow tokens and um, and just sit on them, and they were to rise, let's just say from a dollar to ten dollars, then I would have a ten x return on my investment. If I were to take the same tokens and put them into the liquidity pool. As the as the price of Vow goes up, some of those tokens are going to get sold into the market at higher and higher valuations. So that at the end of the same period, if I wanted to close out my liquidity position, I wouldn't get back the same ten Vow tokens that I put in. And typically, when liquidity is provided, you provide both both sides of the of the pool. So uh, let's just say that I put in. 10 VAL tokens and 10 V dollars into the pool. Uh, and at the time, you know, VAL is, is worth a dollar. And then after a certain amount of time, VAL is now worth $10 or 10 V dollars. So when I retrieve my liquidity from the pool, I may get back, you know, five VAL tokens and 15 V dollars. So even though I only put 10 V dollars in, I got 15 out. So the idea is that. Uh, at least on the constant product, you know, model for liquidity pools, the idea is that I will always get back the value that I put in, even if the composition of that value isn't quite the same. Yeah. And so, because I only got five vow back, I really missed out on the rise in price of the other five that were sold. Right. And they may have sold been sold at different prices. So, in essence. It's kind of the same as a cost average where mm -hmm. I want to I want to actually sell my vow and I'm going to sell it at higher and higher valuations, right? And I'm and I'm gonna keep some core portion of it. And so I experience both the profit and the and the holdership. Right. So the amount of money that you would have made had you just held on to the tokens versus what you made now is called impermanent loss. And that's an important concept because there are a lot of people who frankly don't care about impermanent loss, right? In some ways, impermanent loss is a um, is a product of a speculative position that says, I think VAW is going to be $10, $10 a coin, and I'm just going to hold on to them, right? Uh, as opposed to guys who actually care more about yield. They, they want to make money on the money that they made, and the fact that they're foregoing some of the rise, some of the capital gains uh, on the VAU token is not as important to them because they're getting hard cash out of the deal. Yeah. 
Cause so it's a, it's an arrangement that is very suitable uh, to various kinds of people. Yeah, because you get rewards for putting in the liquidity pool from the, a share of the transaction fees. And sometimes, like I know in Osmodex, they have incentives. Projects will give additional rewards. Um, I Slight aside here, I put into a pool in Osmodex, which today is paying 1,700%. Oh, I like that. That's, that's sweet. <laughs> It'll go down as more pe- sure. as more crypto gets locked into the pool. The APR goes down quite a bit. But hey, yeah. <laughs> I'll take seventeen hundred percent for a day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if so, one of the cool things about liquidity pools is that they give you uh, a great deal of visibility. Uh, as an investor, you know the the traditional uh, interview, the the investor interview process uh, that you go through uh, on on Wall Street is, you know, how old are you? Oh, you're 20. Okay. So that means that you have really big risk tolerance. We can put you into these kinds of stocks and they'll take like a long time to mature, but you'll make a lot of money, but you have the time Mm -hmm. as opposed to, oh, you're a 60 year old guy. You don't have that much time. So let's keep your money really safe, right? We're not looking at high yield, but we're looking at conservation of capital. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the really amazing things about liquidity pools is that the conservation of capital is granted. It's you when you take your money and you give it to a bank, you're in essence lending it to the bank, mm. right? And sure, there's in the United States there's FDIC uh, an insurance scheme in case the bank fails, then they they will give you some part of your money back, not 100, uh, percent and it may take like months and months to get your money back, but okay. But in other countries, uh, when you give your money to the bank that bank is going to go and make loans on projects, make its own risk assessments, and then when things go sour, take it on the chin, go out of business, and that's your money that just disappeared, yeah. right? That will never happen on a liquidity pool because the money is tied up in the pool the entire time, yeah. right? So in, in some ways, um, not, only is your, not only are your funds no longer at risk of confiscation, uh, by merely being in crypto, but they're no longer at risk of loss of other kinds, as in surrendering the funds to some third party, because the third party says a, a smart contract. Yeah. Um, and so this, the kind of yield that uh, is produced by liquidity pools, especially as you make the risks disappear, is traditionally in in uh, the world of finance called alpha. Al- alpha is in essence the difference in the return on investment that an asset uh, produces without having changed its risk profile mm-hmm. right so that's a very attractive thing and um and interestingly uh, i see very little of uh, wall street taking advantage of these mechanisms i think that day will come i, I think yeah they, absolutely and i think it's primarily ignorance they just they just have it they just don't understand it right liquidity pools are creatures of the blockchain they uh, they never dream of uh, of a, a portfolio that sort of rebalances itself at its own cost, right? We're it's decentralized, peer to peer. Yeah, yep, exactly. Okay. So now I just now I want to move this on, right? But I do want to say that you know the liquidity pools, like any you know, like any investment, like any cryptocurrency project, aren't without risks. So people should not put in any more than they can afford to lose. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. they're subject to hacks and bugs and things like that. And uh, absolutely, this that's for any you know do not sell your wife, husband, children, underpants to put it all into this or any other project. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so just to complement your, your perspective there, um, risk is uh, it's a funny thing. You can, you can squeeze it, and then it just sort of pops out on the top, right? And then you can take something else and squeeze it, this and goes out the sides. You never really make the risk disappear. No. You can mitigate the risk. You can, you can, uh, you can take position, risk positions, right? Um, I mean, in, in the old days, uh, I used to work with guys who, who basically hedged one part of the, of the yield curve uh, with another, right? Because they, they knew that given the, the convexity of the curve, at any point in time, a change in interest rates uh, would cause a loss or a gain in one position, and therefore they hedged it with a loss in another position, Right. Um, so, so they became risk neutral to interest rate changes, right? But the but the risk is there; it just changes shape. Yeah, and um, and it's the same with with uh, yeah, any, anything else, including yep. liquidity pools. Yep, yep, yep. We we could carry on because I could say it's it's like choosing a really low value altcoin, 
versus a really safe haven asset like gold. Gold still has risks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now, so that's the liquidity pools. So people can go to Last Network, and if I, um, I, I will go to Last Network after this, and I'll post my link, and people are welcome to use that, or they can go straight to Last Network and and um, take it from there, create their own link. Okay. And any anything else you want to say that before we move on about the taxi? Um. Yeah, only that. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about them, uh, about the conference that. Uh, mm, yes, that we had in Frankfurt. Um, it was, and and really only because it was, um, it was really exciting for me. Um, imagine a, a room full of six hundred Germans, right? And mm. Germans are not that emotive, right? They're, they they don't get up and yell and do crazy things. They're very conservative people. But these Germans were so excited that they were literally on their feet clapping. Like literally, they wouldn't they wouldn't let me deliver the speech because they were so excited about this right. and afterwards um everyone wanted to take pictures with me you know and they were like oh you know so we do this thing you know it's a vow to change the world in fact i have a pin not on me but it says vow to change the world and i think that um to to a large extent so the the essence of my speech was that um that we are um you know we're a commercial sort of initiative right yeah. uh, but it has a very strong philosophical underbelly which is that we really want to change the world we we are we have all of us in in this in this uh, organization if you can call it that um have made a vow to to do everything possible to change the the status quo and that really resonated with the germans um I think that you know one of the the strongest pieces of feedback that I got from almost everyone was that they felt uh, th they they say that I touched them, mm. you know that uh, they felt that I was speaking from the heart and that they want to get behind something where the leadership is is uh, passionate and uh, honest about their direction, right? That they you know they came into this as a as a way to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, which is all good, right? But there's more to life than making money, and this they they really they caught that that sense. Very good. And people can watch the, your speech and and the talks and stuff, the videos from the conference at vimeo.com slash showcase slash val, and I'll have that links in the description below so people, and all the other links so people can go check that out and then do invite them to do so. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll publish. Um, We'll publish all the speeches there. I mean, I think the whole thing is there. And um, uh, one of the things that I talked about, which I think is also an important thing to talk about, is um, so I, I, I took a, a somewhat historical perspective because um, I like to provide context. And so I talked about Prometheus as um, the, the Greek Titan, mm -hmm. as having stolen fire from the gods and given it to humanity, right? And if you think about it, that's that's really sort of what Satoshi Nakamoto did. He he figured something out that was really important, um, something that governments cared about a great deal, which is encryption. And he he um, essentially donated it to humanity. He yeah. understood that the best and only way to protect his discovery was to give it to everyone. Right. And um, and so. In you know, following in his footsteps, uh, Bish has to now bring light into this sort of curated obscurity, as I refer to it in the speech, uh, of money, because uh, money has become a dark art. Um, you know, we have temples and priests um, in, in the middle of this, and um, and they work really hard to make people believe that that money is above their pay grade to understand. Right, and mm -hmm. and you see this a lot whenever you talk to um, to the average guy, and you mention things like yield or inflation, and already their eyes are glazing, and it's like, okay, I, I don't understand this, right? But it's a conditioned response uh, because it's in the interests of the people who manage money today to make sure that nobody else understands how money is managed, because yeah. this is how they they get rich. They literally just print the money and put it in their own pockets, and it's just not more complicated than that. 
And if the average person understood that fact, then uh, right. So so Bish, um, uh, you know, I, and I mentioned in this in the speech as well. There's a price to be paid for um, for giving for releasing fire into humanity, and Prometheus paid this price by having eagles eat his liver every day, right? Um, B uh, Satoshi Nakamoto didn't pay that price because he was clever. He he figured out, hey, I'm going to pay with my life. You know, he, he could have been like Assange, basically, mm. right? He could have been in a box the rest of his life. And so he actually hid his identity uh, really well, thank God. Um, and so, uh, but Bish can't do that. He needs to do this in the open. And so my my basic message to the crowd was, we need to do this with Bish. We need to do this together. And we need to do this big, because big is the only way that we become unstoppable, right? When when there are enough of us, it becomes difficult for the priests to come and slam, you know, stamp down on the movement. Mm. Um, and so they, they, I mean, when I said those words, I mean, people literally just jumped up and just started yelling and crap clapping and say, you know, they really got that um, that message, which I thought was was really it was probably the key message, right? We have to do this together and big yes very good and it will grow and grow and grow and grow okay now v taxi when you first met val taxi when you first mentioned that of course i thought about taxi services but it's not a right. taxi. <laughs> yes. I, so i was uh, i wasn't quite sure what i wanted to call it um uh, i thought v you know val lift perhaps or some kind of transport metaphor Mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up with the taxi because it's it's easy enough for people to to understand. Um, essentially, we have uh, Ethereum.